Hi, today we rectify the rectifier. There is this scientific dispute between Steve Mould, the great science YouTuber, and I around the so-called mold effect. What is it? Oh, it's Steve. Hi, Steve. Hey, Mehdi. So, yeah. something I've learned from YouTube recently. If you have a scientific disagreement, mm -hmm. it's not official yeah. unless you have a wager. Wager. So, I propose yeah. that whichever one of us mm -hmm. turns out to be wrong gives the other 10,000 10, cents. 10,000 cents. Okay. Canadian. Yep. Obviously, because you're Canadian. Yeah, sure. What do you think? I think it sounds good, especially since I'm gonna win and it's gonna pay for my lunch money. <laughs> now, if we can have someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson to settle our dispute, it would be nice. So, you're on! The dispute is just simple mechanics. But if you struggle to understand it, it could have helped you if my sponsor Kiriko was around when you were kids. But it's never late for your children to start with very fun hands-on projects and learn with Kiriko. That's why I got a bunch of these crates for my daughter to try here. <laughs> try Kiriko free for the first month using my link kiriko.com slash electroboom. Anyway, this is mold effect, named after Steve, where you drop this ball chain, it will rise before it falls. I couldn't convince Steve that the reason for this happening is not what he thinks, which is based on a paper published by a professor and his student from Cambridge University, published in the Royal Society. I think their conclusion is incorrect. Well, it's a mechanical problem, so as an electrical engineer, I'm overqualified, but whatever. I'll show you my detailed analysis here. And Steve also just made a video of his analysis in his channel you should watch after my video. Link in the card here and in the description. But at the end of the day, it's my word against his. This video won't be funny, except maybe for the fact that I'll beat Steve. <laughs> But I really hope that you'll stay and listen and understand our reasoning and judge who agrees that I'm right. Anyway, I haven't seen Steve's video, but I can't imagine he has a better argument than me. <laughs> it's just mechanics and I have more subscribers than him, so I must be right. Subscribe to Steve to balance the power. Let me give you a bit of background. I had seen this effect when I was a kid before mold effect was cool. And I thought I knew how it worked until the Cambridge guys explained how they thought it worked. Basically they say because these ball chains have a limited bend radius. Oh look, it already looks wrong. But they say it acts as a lever. Like a chain made with solid rods connected with strings. If you pull the side up, this rod wants to turn around its center of gravity, so it pushes the side down against a solid surface it's sitting on. But the surface being solid provides a counter force and pushes the side up. So basically the Cambridge paper and video claims that this counter force from the table helps fling the chain above the surface before it falls back down. So I was like, Cambridge, Royal Society, Steve Mould, then it must be true. But it didn't sit well with me and I was like, Bleh. it tastes wrong though. This analysis doesn't sound right already. Wouldn't the force from the table also translate into a downward force on this side resisting against the chain rising? Never mind that, if you see here, when I raise the chain from the table, there doesn't seem to be any lever function anyway. The assumption is that these links are solid, so when you raise this ball, the opposite ball wants to go down around the center ball. But in reality, these links are so loose, you just raise this side and the balls rise with almost no lever function. Now, I understand there are strange things around chains falling. For example, a falling chain can drop faster than the acceleration of gravity. There is even a paper on that. Is that paper peer reviewed? Let me show you, here I have a battery and the end of the chain held together with one hand and I'm gonna let go of them together, like this. But for mold effect, I always thought it was due to the momentum of the chain and their explanation felt wrong. But I thought maybe I'm dumb and gave up until I saw something at home and said no. At home, we have a central vacuum system with the hose inside the wall that you pull out, lock and turn on. To put it back in, you unlock the hose and block the suction and the suction will pull the hose back in. 
Doing this, I created the hose mold effect. I unlocked the hose, block it with a cardboard box and let go. I created the effect without the need to push against any surface. The hose runs parallel to the wall until the end that it turns 90 degrees to go in. As the hose speeds up, the momentum of the hose becomes too great and it overshoots before going back into the wall. And that's what's happening to the chain too. So I started talking back and forth with Steve with a lot of analysis and tests and I failed to get into his thick skull. Which is fine, we are just two gentlemen having a civilized scientific disagreement. To the death! <laughs> no, it's a scientific debate of course, and I might have been missing a simple crucial fact and be an absolute fool. I have more subscribers though. In any case, listen to our reasoning carefully and judge. The reason the chain falls of course is because the longer portion outside the container is heavier than the smaller portion inside and it keeps pulling it out. Now listen to the chain falling. Per my calibrated hearing, after the initial acceleration, the chain continues falling at a constant speed, which is what you can see from all other tests too. But the chain is free falling before it hits the ground. Why wouldn't it constantly speed up? It's a chain after all, so the speed of all the moving links is the same under tension. So this link enters the fall at an initial speed of V and gravity must take over and make it go faster. But it doesn't, which clearly shows that there is a force equal and opposite the force of gravity pulling the chain back up. This is the key. I could actually count two of them. Those forces happen when a change in speed or acceleration happens that requires force. One is here where the inertia doesn't want the chain to change speed from zero to some velocity v. And the other one is a total force around the loop here that resists against the change of speed from positive v to negative v. There is also a tiny force of gravity for the tiny bit of chain rising which is much smaller than the large portion of chain falling. Let's ignore that and also let's ignore the friction for now. Now force is equal mass times acceleration and acceleration is equal the change of speed over a period of time. This period of time cannot be zero as in the chain cannot change from zero to some speed or the rising edge cannot change direction instantaneously. Zero time would mean acceleration is infinite and so the force required, which is impossible. So this time period is finite and so the two forces I talked about. See when this chain just starts going at low speeds, these two forces are small because the change of speed is small. So this big force of gravity keeps accelerating the chain. The length of chain between the top here and ground is limited and so this force is almost constant. Unless you drop the chain from very high and it never hits the ground, in that case this force keeps growing. But let's assume the chain hits the ground and this force is constant. As the chain speeds up under this force, these two forces grow larger and larger until the sum of them becomes equal to the force of gravity at which point the chain goes at a constant speed. So as I said, a time period is needed here in in which the chain curves up allowing for the vertical speed to rise gradually. And also another time period is needed to allow the chain to accelerate from positive velocity to negative. So you see the chain must curve up above the surface to allow for the gradual change of speed. The higher the chain falls, the greater the force of gravity and so the opposing forces become stronger. Now call me crazy, but during my testing I may have discovered that the time it takes for the chain to go through the loop is constant, no matter how far the chain drops or the speed of the chain given a specific chain I suppose. Here I painted a link black so we can trace it during the slow-mo. Take a look. Three drop tests at different heights and see the link goes around during the same period. Right here. Let's watch it a bit slower. There, although the chain rises to larger heights for larger drops, the time through the loop seems constant. I don't know why that happens or if that's true. I suppose I could figure it out, but i leave it to you. I know one thing though, if that effect is called mold effect, then that time constant is made is constant. If that's true, it also explains that in higher drops where we have faster speeds, in the same time, the chain has to travel a longer distance through the loop and that's why the loop is taller. Now let me show you a bunch of tests to confirm my theory. 
First off, the edge of the container is a lie. You don't need it. The chain still rises outside the container, so one less factor. Now, if only we could remove the surface the chain is sitting on to show that the chain still jumps up without the need to press against the surface. I guess we could test that in space, but I still have a way to test it. I put the chain on the ground without these lines touching in an imaginary bottomless container have an initial loop here and like I showed we don't need an edge here to have the effect going. Then I'm gonna grab the end of the chain and run this way. Do you think we will have the mold effect? Let's see. So it seems we still have the mold effect without the need to push against any surface. There's only friction that's always against the motion of the chain. Obvious enough, eh? This still didn't convince Steve, that's why we are here. He argued that the chains might be pushing against each other. That's why I spaced them and they don't. He also argued that this effect only happens with ball chains, not the regular link chains. He even did a test to show that those chains don't rise. All right. That's the chain there. First time I'm trying it. Very disappointing. You know, I even chose ones that were like almost like a, a chain of rods. Since I believe you should be able to create this effect if the friction is negligible, I bought a bunch of this chain to try it and quickly I realized this chain is terrible for mold effect. Not that it won't happen with this, but that it generates a ton of losses that drags on the chain and stops it from rising. This chain is especially bad. See, every link generates a lever here that the gravity has to try 10 times harder to pull the chain up and then Bang! It hits the edge here that brings it to a complete stop and then it falls here and then another lever so it's bad! To make it worse, these chains don't freely twist, unlike the ball chain that does. And these tangle and in general they don't rise because they bang and tangle and lose all their momentum and energy. Not because the ball chain makes a better lever. In fact, these guys do make better levers. See? It has such a hard time to drop. So I asked Steve to make it easier for his chain to drop by going around the round pipe and that didn't work either. Got this. Because I'm doing it. It didn't work for me either. But let me do my 2D floor trick and see what happens. Here's this chain. Let's see if it can do well in its ideal habitat. So even this chain can do it. There must be minimal resistance against motion and high speed. In fact, the Cambridge guys did a similar test successfully. They argued that a chain made of rigid rods that act like levers should be able to rise nicely. So they made a spaghetti chain. And see what happens. And they also argued that a chain made of metal balls with long strings between them doesn't have the lever function and so won't rise. And so we'll drop that and see whether that's true as well. And looking at those tests, I believe both those tests were rigged. See, the spaghetti chain test was done in a bowl so that the chain wouldn't hit an edge. Otherwise, it would lose all its energy and wouldn't rise. The ball and chain test was done in a deep cup so the balls would hit the edge and lose their energy. Rigged! I can show you both those chains would loop on my 2D floor test. So, I bought a ton of fishing string and weights and put them like one and a half inch apart on the string. And the damn thing is already all tangled. 
Well, let's do the Cambridge test first. But look at this. It's obvious this thing just bangs against the edge of the glass and has a very hard time to drop. Ah, let's drop it anyway. I'm happy it didn't break the edge of the glass. Look at this chain. So nice and free flowing compared to this one, which looks like it's made of friction. I can see so many reasons why this one wouldn't rise, none of which has anything to do with leverage. Uh, nevertheless, let's see if it can pass the 2D test despite all the friction. Well, it worked despite the friction and lack of leverage. Now if I can make it work dropping it from a height, I'll drop it from my balcony launching it from my whiteboard with no edge and hope for the best. Well I guess I rest my chase. <laughs> Now let me go wash my hands, I hate those lead balls. If I lose this debate, it's because of lead poisoning. Now, before I go watch Steve's side of argument and potentially be proven wrong, I suggest that you make these concepts easy to understand for your kids using practical projects from my sponsor Kiwiko. Kiwiko offers 8 subscription lines, each catered to a different age group, containing super fun hands-on toys and projects to expose kids to concepts in STEAM. With Kiwiko's subscription, first month free at kiwiko.com slash electroboom, each month you'll receive a crate that will keep your child busy with an educational project, especially during their lazy summer holidays, rather than keeping their brains on standby. Are you done? Are you Wow, look at the headset she made on her own. And of course, this is her favorite pencil sharpener now. And you're not done just finishing the project. The book that comes with the project contains a ton of technical information that makes the child excited about the science, techniques, or skills that goes into the project. Kiwiko started by a mom of three to spark creativity, tinkering, and learning in kids of all ages. Same as me, they believe if you start small today, having fun building and learning, you'll have the confidence and skills to do big things tomorrow. So give this gift to your kids and thanks for watching.